Thanks very much. Thanks for the introduction. Um, hello, everyone, wherever you may be, whatever time it may be. Um, it's usually, usually at this point in a talk where I ask for a show of hands of who's heard of the mayor before I've seen it, but so I can't really do that. So I'm just going to assume that some people have and some people haven't. So I'll give a little bit of an introduction to what this museum is, um, what I do there, and then on to how we use um, some synchrotron techniques to help in the conservation effort. So this was a just some oh, there we go. So this was a ship of Henry VIII. He first commissioned it when he came to the throne in 1509, and it started it set sail in 1511. It actually sailed for over 34 years. Um, it's a common misconception that she sank on a maiden voyage, which she didn't. She actually had a, a long um, career and also underwent some renovations mostly to enable them to get more people, um, more cannons, things like that on board. Now this all came to a very, very sudden end in 1545. This here is the cowdery engraving. This was done just shortly after the event, so it's thought to be one of the most kind of accurate representations of what was happening. So Henry was at South Sea Castle, you can see him there. Um, and basically there was an invading French fleet. They had already got onto the Isle of Wight, which is just off the coast here and they were coming to the, the, the south of England to Portsmouth and that's the defending English fleet and in the middle near the castle is where the ship went down. So there's various theories of why it went down but the most commonly accepted one is that they they fired the cannons out of one side, they turned very quickly um, and there was bad weather and this caused, they, they left the gun port um, lids, the openings open and so this caused, caused water to really rapidly flood into the ship and it, by all accounts it went down very quickly and it was actually a huge tragedy so hundreds of men went down with the ship so the ship sank down to the bottom of the Solent they there were some initial attempts to try and get some of the expensive cannons and things like that from it and um, with very limited success and then the site was left untouched until the 1800s at this point there were some divers called the Dean Brothers they developed diving gear at that time and they went down there and took things from it because it was fair game. You could take things and then sell it, most likely. Um, now, the reason that the, the whole site the, of the whole collection has survived is because the ship went down, sank onto its starboard side or its right hand side. Um, and it, over time, it was covered in silt. And what this did was basically block off the site. So there was no oxygen getting to it. So typical um, degradation mechanisms for both organic and inorganic materials just couldn't operate there because the oxygen was cut off and so it just sealed everything there. Now, when it came to the 1960s, there was a local historian and diver, Alexander McKee, who made it his goal to try and find the Marios because we had maps of where she sank that were thought to be quite accurate. Now, obviously, the, the thing that had preserved the collection made it more difficult to find. And at the time in the 60s, they used what is um, what was state-of-the-art sonar and acoustic techniques to find an anomaly under the seabed. This then prompted them to do some excavations there, and then they eventually discovered that this was the Mary Rose. Here are some pictures from that excavation. I'm told by my colleagues that these photos are taken on a good day. It's not the clearest to see here. Um, and on the right there is Margaret Rule, who's the league archaeologist, and it shows you her uncovering some of the artifacts. Here are some longbows that were found in a, in a chest in really remarkable condition. The ship itself, or the, the half of the ship that we have, was raised in 1982. Um, some of you may have may remember this image, and the cradle that the ship is on, it's still on to, to this day. So the ship came up on the cradle and then was taken into the naval base here at Portsmouth into a dry dock, and you can see the ship there. Alongside the ship we raised over 19,000 artefacts and there's a huge range in terms of the size of them, the material that they're made of, so we have lots of inorganic, organic, so we have wood, leather, wool, sometimes knitted wool, we have a whole range of different metals, um, wrought and cast iron, pewter, brass, bronze, silver, gold, on and on and on. Um, and also what's really interesting about our collection is there's a huge range. So there's the kind of everyday living equipment, there's the tankards and the cooking equipment and the cleaning equipment. There's also all the weapons, um, but there's also really personal items. And what I find really interesting about this collection is it also has the whole um, spectrum of society. Often it's not the everyday person things that survive, but obviously with this, it was just everything that was preserved there. So you do have the everyday items of the the sailors and soldiers that were on board. 
Now, in terms of the, this talk is going to focus on the wood. Obviously, there's lots of different materials, but um, the ship is made of wood, and there's also a lot of wood of items in our collection. Now, what is, um, the, the wood is actually in, in really good condition, considering everything it's been through. Um, this is a, a cross section of a piece of wood. This is very typical of what it looks like, that you have this well-preserved interior and a darker degraded exterior. And you can see that in the SEM and light images shown there, that um, the interior is pretty much like fresh wood. It's retained that cellular structure, whereas below you start to see that it's lost some of the cellulose and hemicellulose. Now, what happens when it's under the water is all of that is swelled up by the water. So the, the water kind of lends itself to give some structural integrity. Um, but if you just let that come out when it dries, then it could shrink and collapse and some, sometimes it could damage it in an irretrievable way. So what we typically do is a consolidation treatment. Uh, we use polyethylene glycol, there are other alternatives. This is the most commonly used one. We usually use PEG. And if possible, what you do is you put it into a tank and you, let, you slowly increase the concentration of the PEG so it diffuses into the wood and then you freeze dry it. Now, the freeze drying is purely because it's quicker, so you get less dimensional change. Now, in the case of the ship, so the, the part of the ship that we have is about 34 meters long. Now, unless, so we could have dismantled it, but that would have been challenging for lots of reasons, or built a tank around it. Um, for lots of reasons, neither of these were, were feasible. So we constructed a spray system around the ship. Um, and we sprayed with two different grades of PEG, PEG 200, which is a, a liquid at room temperature, and then PEG 2000. So the, the image without a person on that you see there, this is a photo I took just before we started drying the ship. Um, and that, that was the kind of visibility in there. And this is actually after we, we would turn the sprays off for about an hour at a time for us to go in there. So that's actually with the sprays off. So, and that was with PEG 2000, which meant that we had to heat it, which is why it all looked like this. And so the last time I was in there, it was about 98% humidity and um, about 30 degrees. So it was fairly unpleasant in there. Again, when it came to drying the ship, we couldn't put it into the freeze dryer. So we developed a air drying method where we, we put all this metal infrastructure in to hold these fabric tubes, which then had holes in to deliver air. And the way that they were positioned was based upon CFD modeling of looking at having, the, having a consistent temperature, humidity, and velocity of the air all around the ship. Because what you're wanting to do is reduce the possibility of one bit drying faster than the other. So you can see us here installing um, some of those drying tubes. But the picture with the four people, um, I'm one of those, I'm not quite sure what we're looking so intently at, but something to do with the inst installation of the tubes. And then at the bottom, you see the three big air handling units, which are creating the environment around the ship. Now, the, the thing that we were wary of at this point is, um, the wood, like all of our collection, a lot of the challenges come because of the stuff that is in it from the seawater or from corroded artifacts. So if you imagine these things have essentially been marinating in seawater for hundreds of years. So for example, the, there are iron cannonballs that have a lot of chlorine in, which can be very challenging in terms of their conservation because of the corrosion products they're from. With the wood, what we find is, I mean, there's all kinds of stuff in it. There's salt, as you would imagine, there's um, sulfur, calcium, sodium, iron, um, and what can happen is the sulfur salts, sulfates basically can form and they don't look very good. So this here is a, a chest panel and then the other image is a bolt hole from a gun carriage. And so that's where an iron bolt would have been, but obviously that's totally cor corroded. And what you have are these um, kind of sulfur iron deposits in its place. Now this, this was first seen in the Vasa. So they, they saw these salts forming on the surface and they are very acidic, so they can damage the wood. So the Vasa, if you haven't heard of it, is a, a Swedish, Swedish warship, which is on display in Stockholm. That one did sink on its maiden voyage um, and is a little younger than the Mary Rose, but was raised before it. So we work quite closely with them and look at you know, what's worked for them and what hasn't. Now they, they found these salts and they actually did a set of experiments at um, SSRL to look what form the sulfur was in. So some of you will be familiar with um, sulfur chemistry and the fact that when you use zanes, you, you can really clearly distinguish the different oxidation states. Now, what they discovered was, what they traced back, was that sulfur from seawater, sulfate, had interacted with sulfur reducing bacteria, which obviously in those, in those low oxygen or no oxygen conditions, that lots of bacteria can't 
operate, they thrive in. So then they had reduced the sulfur and then there was things um, a plenty for them to interact with. And a lot of the time it's iron. So you end up with these metal sulfides, usually iron sulfides that get lodged in the wood. And then when you chain, when you expose it to air, it can gradually oxidize and you end up with this whole mixture of things in the wood. So for example, on a piece of Mary Rosewood, this is some, these are some preliminary experiments we did years ago at SSRL. Um, you, you only have to move a small amount on the wood and well, already you can see that there's lots of different sulfur in there, um, but you only need to move a couple of millimeters and you can completely change the percentage of oxidized to reduce sulfur there. Um, and there's also been other work done, which um, you know, it shows that it changes much more um, rapid on a much smaller length scale as well. So what you end up with is this huge mixture of things. And what we were concerned about is that in starting to dry the ship, um, that we would be, you know, we, we had to expose it to air to dry it, but that we would be exposing it to air and then promoting the formation of these damaging products. Um, Jerry, I forgot to ask, when, do you want me to pause for questions at times? Um, uh, usually we have uh, uh, two breaks during the lecture for uh, questions. Um, uh, I did have a question, so I'll go ahead and ask now, I suppose. Since go for it. Uh, what roughly is the uh, sulfur, either atomic fraction or mass fraction in these woods? Uh, it's honestly, it's not totally known because you would, there's such, it's so heterogeneous, the wood. Um, but some, some analysis done years ago based on a, just a few cores from the ship, it, it was about a, a few mass percent along those lines. Okay, so quite, quite a bit then. I see. Okay. Mm -hmm. And what again was, I'm so sorry, what again was the name of the ship in, was it Sweden? That, the Vasa. Uh, thank you. That's, uh, that's very interesting. That's, if you, if you ever, if you go to Stockholm, it is well worth a visit. So they have the whole ship and it's very, very impressive, but it sank on its maiden voyage because it's, it's really, really top heavy. The story goes that the king at the time kept telling them to put more and more um, kind of sculptures and stuff on it. So then it just went out and toppled over, basically. Excellent. All right. Well, thank you. You should continue. This is wonderful. Okay. Um, so yeah, this was our first kind of look at just a, a bit of Mary's wood. I should say we, alongside the ship and the and the collection, the kind of identifiable objects, we're, we're lucky that we have lots of other bits of wood. Some of them are not identified. Some of them are kind of fragments of it. So it enables us to be able to do um, different types of testing, basically. Um, so what we did then was set up a program of work with Diamond Light Source. That's actually just about an hour and a half up the road from us here in Portsmouth. And what we wanted to do was take core samples from the wood. So we were literally drilling into the wood and taking out cores, which were about five millimeters in diameter. The length varied where they were taken from, but usually between um, 10, 10, 15 centimeters. And so we would take these, package them up, take them to the beam line, and then carry out sulfur cage um, zanes down the length of it to look what was happening. Now, I've shown some of the data here. We, for, on the top is when we were still spraying with pegs. So this is before we've turned the sprays off. Um, and what you can see is obviously most of it is reduced sulfur. There's maybe a tiny bit of oxidized sulfur um, on the surface. But then five months after drying, what you see is quite a dramatic change in that, that you're getting much more oxidized sulfur on the surface, but also into the depths of the wood. Now, the one thing to, to point out here or acknowledge here is you're not looking at the same sample, right? Because once you've taken it out, you can't put it back in. Um, so we just chose locations around the ship and took samples from nearby it. It was kind of the, the best we could do. Um, but what we saw was this pattern happening around the ship. So that gave us confidence that that is what was happening. Um, thankfully, it hasn't over the over the years since then, um, it hasn't got worse than this. Um, and what we've actually stopped that program of work now because we weren't seeing much more change, but also because the, sh the wood is so dry now and it, partly because it's in such good condition, it's so difficult to take a core sample now. So if you if you drill into the wood, the force that you have to put on it, first of all, just like crushes the core or it applies so much heat that, it, you know, I would question what it's doing to the wood. Um, we also did some work at ESRF. So we wanted to look at a small length scale, what was happening. So again, 
the same sample when we were still spraying and when we weren't. And we, we, we did XRF imaging at different sulfur energies so we could isolate the reduced from the oxidized. So in these, the, the green is the reduced and the blue is the oxidized. And then we picked out different points where we could look at what was forming there just to give us a bit more information on what was happening. But then this is actually then some work we did in the lab at the Mary Rose because yes, we could show that it was changing, but what I wanted to know was what, what was it actually doing to the wood. So FTIR analysis is used a lot um, with archaeological wood materials because you can isolate the, the lignin, hemicellulose and cellulose, the main components in the wood. And you'll find that even though there might be a bit of degradation of the lignin, it's usually um, the cellulose and hemicellulose that are preferentially degraded. So when you look at the ratios of these components, you typically find much a much higher ratio of lignin to the other two. So here we have a core sample on the top. The first thing that was quite interesting was you could see the darker region at the surface and then in the middle of the core. Um, now what we then did was do some benchtop XRF on that and you could see sulfur and iron. Interestingly, we also found zinc there as well. So this was kind of news that this was co-locating with it and that they sure enough did correlate to where you had more degradation. And also we could see, um, this data isn't shown here, but we could also see that as the sulfur was oxidized, you were getting more, um, more wood degradation. We then, I'm just gonna slightly sneakily go away from um, X-ray absorption, but just as it relates to the data, some other experiments we did at ESRF, um, looking at, first of all, tomography so this we we quite often look at fresh wood compared to the mary rose wood um, so you can see a fresh oak sample um, on one side and then on the other side we have the mary rose wood so you can see that the surface sample there's a lot of disorder you can't really see the wood structure but as you go down into the depths of the wood you start to um, get back some of that wood structure it starts to look more like the fresh oak now what's Great right. on this beamline is that you can also then do PDF analysis at each point. So you can look at all the different phases, amorphous, nanocrystalline, and compare it to standards to kind of look at a distribution through the wood. So this is one of our core samples again, um, just a, two top sections. So you can first of all see everything that's there. And then we were able to isolate where the peg is. And as expected, it's at the surface, but also in gathering in the vessels, as you would expect. And then interestingly, we also found this, this phase that wasn't so close to the surface, a bit further down, these, these um, nanoparticles, and they turn out to be a zinc blend, so a zinc iron sulfur. So this correlates quite nicely with the, the other data that we've taken showing the iron sulfur and the zinc together. May, um, maybe we'll pause there again if there are any other questions. Um. Uh, I had a, a, a few questions concerning the wood. Um, uh, what other spectroscopies or synchrotron methods do you anticipate using in the future? I don't know. <laughs> um, <laughs> we've done some, we've, we've recently done some um, X-ray diffraction at, at Diamond. It was kind of a scoping study really to see what we could see with it. And I know prior to when I started working there, there were some XPS analysis at Diamond um, completed. Um, but yeah, I'm not sure at this point. Okay. Um, sorry. Um, uh, what about the uh, 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 involving the artifacts? Has there been uh, uh, has there been much synchrotron work to characterize them or is that uh, anticipated in the future? Um, so, I mean, a lot, of the, the, a lot of the samples that we looked at, are they are artifacts, they are bits of Mary Rose wood, some are from the samples. You, you, we have looked at whole artifacts as well at, um, at Diamond. There was some work done on, on gun shields. We also have quite a big project on um, some of the iron cannonballs, and we've also done some work on some of the brick materials as well. Um, so there is a whole range of, of, of different, different materials and objects. We tried, to, in the most part, if it's trying to understand the process that's happening or things like that, I'll try and work on the, the other bits rather than taking a kind of whole nice object somewhere. It's much harder to look after that in some ways. Okay, very good. Thank you. Uh, there is one more question um, about uh, spatial resolution and uh, beam damage, and I think more generally about beam damage. 
Um, do you have uh, uh, sulfur, of course, can be a little bit notorious uh, for beam damage. What are your thoughts uh, on that? On that? So well, I'm actually doing some work at, um, at the moment. Some of you will probably know Sam Webb at SSRL. Um, so I, I did a, a postdoc out there years ago. So I um, worked with him then. So we at the moment uh, are looking into that and working um, uh, with another researcher combining in FTIR as well. So we're looking at if, if you do the analysis, what does it show? And then what, how much is damaged and going back and forth? Because whilst there's been a lot of work on that on other archaeological or cultural heritage materials, there's been less so on the wood. So um, I don't know the answer, but I hope I'm going to find out. <laughs> Very good. All right. There's also a comment that Max 4, the synchrotron Max 4, is developing a specialized beamline for the forest industry and that this could be of, uh, could be of interest to you. Nice. Thank you. Very good. Okay, um, so then just moving on then to, to what we kind of can do about this, you know, some of this damage has already happened, but what, what's, quite, um, what's quite nice about our collection is, first of all, there's a lot of repetition in it. So there are a lot of materials, um, for example, you know, there's, there's thousands of cannonballs and there's thousands of arrows. Um, and, and also though that not everything has been conserved. So with some things, if something in the past maybe hasn't worked as well or new methods have been developed, we have the opportunity to apply them to them. So, so we're always looking at the conservation from two different points of view. There's a, what do we do with what's things that have already been treated? And what do we do if we were starting again? Because like I say, with some of the materials, they haven't been conserved and we have that opportunity. Um, so this, some, I first started working with the Mary Rose when I was doing a postdoc at the University of Kent and it was in partnership with the Mary Rose and we were looking at potential neutralization treatments. In this we were looking at um, carbonate based nanoparticles. We actually chose strontium carbonate mostly because the strontium was a good marker that we could see where it was in the wood. Also the idea was that the strontium carbonate would go in, it would react with any of the sulfate compounds there and form strontium sulfate which is relatively insoluble. So while she would still have it in the wood, it would kind of be stabilizing it. Um, so this is just some of the, the work we did then, looking at trying to get the, the, these particles into the wood. Now we, we were working with really tiny bits of wood, putting them in a solution and sonicating them. And this is often what happens that we, we start with the kind of trying to prove the, the chemical process and then change to, to thinking how we would practically apply this to the collection. Um, but yeah, we use Zanes here to show that before we treated it, you had a, a natural gerocyte. That's quite common because you've always got so much sodium in the wood, so it's a sodium ion sulfate. Um, and then after treatment, we sure enough have formed the strontium sulfate. So it shows up really nicely in the in the sulfate um, Zanes when you have um, that different associated element with it. So that kind of proved the, the concept that we could form that. Um, so then what we wanted to do was look at ways to actually apply it. Um, and what we did here was we simulate, we kind of chemically simulated the wood. So we took fresh oak samples and we soaked them in iron sulfate solutions. Now this in a lot of ways is making the, the, the worst case scenario because the fresh wood obviously isn't degraded. So it's got much less pathways in. So if we can get something to work on this, then we can, um, you know, you know, you've got, you're going to have much better uptake in the area of samples. And I'd, I'd been to a conservation institute in France where they used cellulose patches quite a lot. So when you have cellulose powder and you mix it with water, it makes quite a nice putty. And so what we did was then mix in the carbonate um, nanoparticles with that and then you can stick it onto the wood. And what's quite nice is it kind of moulds around and then it just naturally dries and then it, it, it just peels off. So we've started investigating these um, and we did do some, um, some synchrotron work on these to look at what was happening to both the oak and the patch that came off. So again, you can see that the, um, we do start to form some strontium sulfate in the oak after the treatment. Um, also looking at the iron K edge, we can see that we're forming iron carbonate, which makes sense. Um, but what was quite nice about this is I'd first of all looked at it in the sense of um, ways to administer the particles to the wood but what it also was doing because it's acting like a poultice is sucking these things out of the wood too so we looked at the patch and and yeah you could detect both sulfur and iron there so work is ongoing with that to try and um understand how to how efficient it is how if there's any damage to the wood because obviously i can peel it off and i can see that there isn't any damage but that doesn't 
completely answer the question and and these are all the things we'd want to know before we then applied that to um, one of our bits of um, the Marios or one of our artifacts and then other bits we're, we're starting to look at the but both of these have promise and and what we what we do is we try to develop lots of different treatments to account for different scenarios so what is one thing treating the ship it's one thing treating an artifact and sometimes some of the artifact when I'm, I'm either talking about an artifact and it might be a wooden plate or it might be a wooden gun carriage and obviously I can't take that off display I can't go and put it in another tank so we try and do all these different things um but the only thing with these with this treatment that that is potentially not so great is that you're I'm yet again putting something else into the wood whereas really I'd like to take things out and um, so that's why the, the patch looked quite interesting and then some just just as to finish on some of the stuff we've been looking at now is different ways that we could um, make materials that would go in and capture something like iron which plays such a key role in this and drag it out of the wood so it's quite a common conservation technique to use collating agents like DTPA or EDTA and soak the things in them um, and so we're looking at ways that if we can attach them to particles and find a way to drive the treatment in and out whether that would be a better solution and if we if we could develop a technology like that that would be good for a lot of the collection because as I said all of it suffers really from from all this stuff that's in it that you wouldn't normally find there um, and yeah I mentioned briefly before so we've, we've done um, synchrotron experiments on the wood lots of different techniques also on the iron cannibals and also now more recently on the brick so we have we have thousands of bricks which is sometimes quite surprising to people but it was used for the galley so the, there would be a big copper cauldron in it and, and now really what I'm realizing is that any kind of porous material that could get these sulfur um, compounds in there's the potential that this will be a problem and what we found with the bricks is that they it's the actual the crystals that are forming that are damaging and if they are exposed to a high humidity and then that dissolves and then recrystallizes and gets bigger and bigger it then physically breaks the brick apart so that's some relatively recent work that we've started doing um so i was gonna end there there's obviously lots of people involved in all these different projects which actually there's data there from probably the last um 10 years um and I always finish with this slide. Obviously, you can't do that at the moment. <laughs> but if you do find yourself in the, the south of England, do come along and visit us. And we've got lots of social media channels where you can hear what we're up to. So, um, yeah, I hope to see you all there one day. Thank you very much. There we are. Thank you. It was, it was fascinating. Um, uh, uh, the uh, the ship in Sweden, whose name I've forgotten again, I apologize. Do you know if there's been um, uh, much synchrotron work done on uh, on the artifacts from that sh from that ship? They so they did some of the first work at Vassar on um, the on the sulf They kind of looked at the sulfur problem to start with, so that was work at SSRL, um, and then yeah, they they've done. I'm not sure how much recent work so they have in the past but they actually don't have as many artifacts because the ship went out on its maiden voyage so they have the whole ship but not as many artifacts and we have half the ship and lots more artifacts so it's quite quite, quite different so they in the past they've done quite a lot on the wood but i don't believe there's as much going on at the moment i see do you have many artifacts where um uh, uh they need at least for a while or perhaps permanently to be stored in uh, anaerobic conditions we don't store anything in anaerobic conditions they're all in a everything is in a controlled environment but it's usually around um about 54 percent humidity and about 19 degrees it's based purely on the organics most of the time because we've got so many more of them um and yeah we don't have anything in an anaerobic condition the other thing that's i mean with some of this the, the thing that always then you have to bear in mind is the fact that it is a museum because i've had the i've had before it suggested to me that the ship could have been dried in like i don't know nitrogen or something <laughs> but, but obviously and also there's the constraint of part of the reason um, one of the things for us as well is so we're a charity we're a charitable trust so all of our all of our income comes from ticket sales and donations so there's a the cost implications even now one of the big streams in my work is looking at the conditions that we hold the wood in and actually what the practical implications are if you change them because the running costs for i mean you can see the the picture behind me that enclosure that's all kept at that steady state environment and the costs associated with that are quite huge i see okay there's a question about the um 
Uh, you showed results from the oak showing co-location of zinc and iron at a spot below the surface. Um, mm -hmm. uh, is there a, a particular mineral that's uh, being formed there or why are they co-locating? I am not sure at the moment. I mean, I think normally with the the iron and sulfur, there's been a lot more work on that and you'll find um, pyrite and gregite and things like that. So you're, that, that's quite well documented. The zinc is less so. And honestly, we're still trying to figure it out and figure where it came from. So there's various sources. It could, it, you do have some in seawater, you do have some of the artifacts, but maybe not as much. So um, yeah, that's quite a recent discovery that we're trying to figure out. <laughs> 